Coming up on this episode of Fuzz TV. Farm diversification in the East Nuka Fife. The benefits of having interests away from the farm. Grazing winter cereals. And one woman's determination to prove the doubters wrong. I find we're quite ridiculed for things because they don't think we can do it. But actually... We can do it fine, maybe better than men in some cases. Locally sourced food is ever increasing in popularity. Bow House in the East Nuka Fife is one business trying to bridge the gap between farm and fork. Balkaski Estate developed Bow House after seeing a gap between food production and sale of it in the local area. Sam Parson is the factor at Bow House and has been heavily involved in the development of the food market and on site producers at Bow House. was the, the disconnect between the food being produced in the fields and the consumer. Toby Anstruther set up Food from Fife uh, and was instrumental in some of that early uh, discussion on getting food networks to work together and realised that it was very difficult to get produce out of the field and into a restaurant or onto a table. Most of it went away to be processed elsewhere. Most of what we produced was large-scale uh, commodity product, whether that's grain, beef, it doesn't really matter. It goes away to be processed elsewhere. You lose a fair degree of control on that and at some point you're always pitched against the next cheapest. And so in, a, in an environment like here, in a country like the UK, we're never going to be the cheapest. Um, but we wanted to try and separate uh, quality and, and uh, value from quantity and uh, low, low value. Bowhouse has been developed over time, but there were some initial challenges to overcome. I'd say that the earliest challenge we had was, uh, was planning permission and trying to get an acceptance of creating a space with um, users that we couldn't be specific about what they were going to do. It wasn't retail, it was, uh, it was production. Obviously planning is the biggest hurdle that anybody comes across when you change use. It took us a long time to get an understanding that we were trying to create a uh, flexible workspace. We couldn't say exactly what business was going into them, just the sort of businesses that were going into them. And that's quite hard to get across in a planning application, which is usually very specific. So uh, that held us up by a couple of years. Build cost always holds you up. We thought we would be eligible for grants, um, and we thought that it was sort of almost turnkey ready for getting grants for food processing, etc but actually didn't really fit any of those uh, application windows, so we had to source the funding uh, elsewhere. I think if we were, had more confidence early on, it was, there was nothing really to follow. As the project goes on, you start to question what you're doing, you start to, you, you go from the physical build, the excitement of physical build and delivery, to the confidence sort of shake of, will people come, will it work, will, it, will everybody else get it, and actually, you just have to go with your gut feeling and just not, and not, not deviate from what you set out to do. All in all, the development of Bow House has been a success and the business is doing well. Continuing to do what we set out to do is, is definitely a success. I think if we had taken the money from the, the first uh, events that wanted to come in here and pay good money to be in here, we would have just become an event space and it would have confused the message. As with any enterprise, publicity plays a key role in the success of the business. We bought in a PR company. Uh, we chose somebody because they were their, their background was food and they were quiet PR. It sounds ridiculous, but they didn't shout from the rooftops. They were just conscious about where they put us and what they did in order to promote us. With PR, um, you know, obviously we can create a Facebook page and we can create a website. We can do... We can do things, but actually we, didn't, we don't understand the first thing about PR. We now, we now know just how much we don't understand about PR, but only because we had PR. We set out with, this, uh, with the aim to have somebody in to help us on specialist things, and PR was one of them. 
we're situated here on the coastal route uh, between Ely and uh, Anstruther, effectively. Uh, there's a huge tourist uh, population that come through here in the summer, and so the site itself has a fantastic shop front. Th those, those tourists are not here all year, so we needed, we needed the site to actually be able to function without those customers. Uh, and it works because actually there is, a, there is a food network that works along these coastal roads as well. Recently, they've added their own butchery. This allows them to control the food chain from fields to fork. We've got our own butchers in here now, and we, we needed to, to take control of doing the butchery because it's the last part of our food chain effectively, and we needed to take control of that. We were always saw the, the, farm, the, the farm on the estate as, as producing something that we wanted to get away from commodities and, and take it further down the line to its customer. In order to do that, you either use somebody else uh, to process it and then you sell it with your label on, or you do the processing and sell it with your label on. And we knew that with the scale of what we were doing, it, we weren't big enough to be important enough to somebody else who was processing and packing. And, and we, wanted to, we wanted to take control of that and do it our way. And then if we promise a customer we're going to do something, well, it's our fault if we don't. So how do you deal with the challenges which occur? We knew we couldn't go through a year or six months or however long it was without doing something. And so the question for us was, what are we here for? What do we do? We've learned not to be too reliant on what we think is going to happen, but to understand that the world changes and we have to change with it. And if the, the demand isn't there, then we won't do it. And if the demand is there, we'd love to carry on doing it. It's never good for a business to stand still and have no future aspiration. Expanding on what we're doing, so we're still looking for more people to produce on small scale plots of land. We're still looking for more producers. Uh, we, we don't want success, success to leave us, so as somebody's business grows we want to be able to build space for them to move into and then allow space for somebody else to come in behind them. We've still got more space here to be converted. We would like to think that actually this, you know, this it's a weekly market, the weekly collection of food can continue uh, and with the use of the cafe that is run here now as well, that gives us a permanence to the way that the, the site runs, gives us a heart that's working all the time. For more information on diversification, visit faz.scot. Andrew Tully is a new entrant to farming based at Wichester's farm in Hoyk. Andrew's family have been tenant farmers in the area for over a hundred years. He got the tenancy for Wichester's when he was 25 years old. Wichester's is a 330 hectare upland farm just south of Hoyk in the Scottish borders runs from 750 to 900 foot, mainly in by or, or semi-improved ground, a bit of rough grazing, um, about kind of 70-30 split. Also covering quite a significant area of uh, triple SI, which we, we manage. Since arriving on the farm, Andrew has made several changes to the way things are run, including converting to organic production, replacing purchased concentrates with homegrown feeds, lambing outdoors and making the most of grazed grass. Before the organic conversion, the farm carried 100 cows and 900 breeding ewes, though Andrew has temporarily reduced those numbers slightly whilst establishing the organic system. Through some of the QMS grazing group, um, which I went along to some of the the meeting, mainly in the second round of grazing meetings, which are good. There's a lot of like-minded people that kind of opened your eyes to stuff. And also following a lot of other farmers on Twitter, opens your eyes to what's going on elsewhere in the country and people that are, are running similar systems or, or systems that you want to aspire to. And it's quite good. And I find that people are very receptive to just asking them questions. You know, not even people that you know, perhaps, if you see something interesting, you know, to send them a message and ask them about it. People are really receptive. Getting off farm to go to these meetings is great. And in the past, I probably didn't make time to do it enough. And, you know, you'd see meetings or whatever advertised 
that you probably should work out and it didn't. But there's loads out there, you know, QMS or HDB or SAC, or they're really interesting. And while it's got these meetings, and you might just pick up one thing, and that's enough to make it worthwhile. But it's also a great chance to, to network, I suppose, speak to other people. And I think in general, that's something I, I, I should have done more of and I will do more of in the future is take on professional advice. It's probably worthwhile paying for that advice from, from consultants or advisors that are going to help shape and, and drive your business forward. And some of the time, if you have some of these people on farm, it just backs up what you're already thinking, but it gives you the confidence that you're, you're doing the right thing. So what advice would Andrew give to himself looking back and to those in a similar situation to him just starting out? Time management probably hasn't been a great strength of mine in the past. A lot of it's down to making the system simple. It's cutting out problems. It's about what's getting most value out of it. You know, try not to do everything yourself. I don't run a lot of machinery at all. You just have to accept that you're going to pay somebody to do that side of it. And um, you do what you can and try to be as efficient as you can. Started moving more towards selling lamb store. Um, that clears up grazing in the back end, but also clears up a lot of time. I just have to just have to make the time to try and to try and get off farm for that side of things and, and also for in terms of family time. I have a young family so that's you know another regret I have in the past that I've probably not put in enough time into them when I was needed at home. So that's something I make a huge effort to do now and it's it's a priority that you know work fits around the family and not the other way around try and organise a system to make it easy for myself to get away, to get time off. And I don't feel guilty about that anymore. I maybe did in the past. You had this guilt that you struggle to relax, you struggle to go away because you were thinking of this and that. And But you just have to, you have to switch off and go away. And I think there's more people realising that, certainly among my peers and my age group in the past, who maybe thought that you always had to be seen to be working and stuff. If your business is running such a way that you can never get away, there's no... It's nothing to be proud of, you know, in fact, quite the opposite. So, And it helps that my father can keep an eye on things when I'm away or there's a, a young lad that's self-employed who's very good. So I can go away now quite happy in the knowledge that things are fine. It's obviously a huge thing in agriculture and it is people looking after themselves. And it's something I probably didn't do well enough over the years. And I used to do a lot of sport, used to do a lot of running, mountain biking. I played rugby at college, all these kind of things, and a lot of these things probably fell by the wayside with with a with a farm and with family and stuff. I probably paid the price, you know. But mental health hasn't been great at times, and you know I've had to get help for that. And now definitely trying to get back to to running, to exercise, has been a massive thing. I quite enjoy training dogs as well. So I got a wee cocker spaniel, which I, I train up as a gun dog. And that's great, it's tight, it's something you really have to focus on, you have to clear your mind of everything else and, and focus on that. And it, again, finding work with him, you know, gives you a few days off the farm during the winter. So it's a massive thing, it's, it's a thing that's spoken about more now, but it still needs to be spoken about further. It's something that, yeah, you're far more productive if you have time to switch off. Perthshire, Ian Wilkinson has been looking at ways to improve margins in his sheep and cereal enterprises. Grazing of winter cereals is becoming more popular in Perthshire. And three years ago, he began experimenting with winter grazing of cereals. Not only has it reduced his winter feeding costs for the sheep, it's also increased the yields he obtains for his winter sown crops. The total benefits of grazing with winter cereals is yet to be discovered at Balgay Farm. Balgay is owned by Ian and Sheena Graham. I came here four years ago to help the Grahams manage uh, Balgay on a share farm and stroke collaboration agreement. My background is predominantly in livestock uh, with like minimal arable experience. We've increased the livestock now to 200 suckler cows and 450 ewes. We also rent a further 400 acres of permanent pasture 
to allow us to keep this amount of livestock during the summer. Bulgate itself is basically what is classed as a heavy clay soil. Can be very difficult to work if you you know if you if you work it at the wrong time or in the wrong conditions, it can really come back to bite you. We're growing winter barley, winter oats, winter wheat, and a winter oil seed rape. We do grow some spring barley, but we try to keep that to an absolute minimum. The key to this farm is to try and get it sown into winter crops and keep ground, keep uh, growing cover on the soil at all times. Grazing of winter cereals offers benefits to both the stock and the grain. The benefits are, one, you can control the growth in the crop. Uh, it gives us cheaper grazing for winter grazing, so it allows us to take our uh, ewe hogs through the winter on very little cost. The other benefits are a yield increase uh, when we come to harvest the crop, we've seen a yield increase of half a ton a hectare. Also, we're hoping that we'll see a reduction in chemical use in, uh, firstly, fungicides, because we're taking out all the dead, the dead leaves and the infected leaf area for the crop to start away in the spring with fresh growth. And hopefully there'll be a little bit less weed pressure as well, because the sheep will have grazed all the weeds out. And I suppose longer term, once we start to improve the soil structures through the, the no-till and whatnot, we might be able to start reducing fertiliser use. So what advice would Ian give to anyone thinking of trying this themselves? Top tips for doing it, for anybody wanting to do it, would be just get on and do it. Just go, just push the boundaries, just have a go, put some sheep on some cereals and see what happens. I would say use... A lower class of stock like your dry ewe hogs, don't use your high production end stock like fattening lambs or possibly in lamb ewes because their energy needs at that time of year might be too high for what you're actually getting out of the crop. You can do it with electric fencing. Your fields don't need to be properly fenced like our ones here are it in this field, but you can easily put up temporary electric fencing around some fields and just get on and give it a try and see how it works. The other thing would be if you want to take somebody else's sheep in to graze is make sure that you have full control of it because you need to be able to take that sheep off when you think that either the sheep are suffering or the crops are going to suffer because it's too wet. In Highland Perthshire, Katrina Kennedy has already made her mark in the agricultural industry. At 23, she already has a strong passion for livestock farming. So here at Lurgan, we're tenant farmers here and we've been here for 25 years. Um, the farm is 1,700 acres, so that's like 690 hectares. 90% of that is hill ground. We're running 600 breeding ewes and about 65 cows. Cows are split into two different herds, so there's the Highlander herd and the Continental herd, and that's limousine cross Belgians. And um, we run two bulls, so there's a limousine bull who goes over the Continentals and a white red shorthorn that goes over the Highlanders. We're running three different flocks, so there's the cross flock, the Cheviot flock, and then the Blackie flock. Um, the crosses are a mix between Beltex, Texel, Blue Domain, and Millennium Blue. So the blues do our mule part, and it gives us like more prolificity and size amongst our sheep. Sometimes people choose agriculture, and sometimes agriculture chooses you. There's been no question of what I was going to do. It's always been, you know, from the word go, this is, this is what I want to be doing. Agriculture is a huge passion of mine, you know, primarily stock. Um, I'm not quite so keen on arable, um, but I suppose, you know, it's what we're used to. Um, we've always been around stock. Yeah, I take a big pride in what, what I'm doing here. Like, just love to be with the ewes and working the dogs and making sure everything's fine, so, yeah. I went to Oak Ridge College and studied for a year and a half in agriculture. Um, and then when Dad went on as um, Vice President for NFU Scotland, I left college and started working full-time here. So I've been here about nearly five years full-time.
Being a young and small female farmer comes with its challenges, but from challenges come opportunities. We usually start feeding the yows um, end of November, beginning of December. They get yow rolls um, and they'll be getting fed right the way through till about the middle of May. So it's a long time to be feeding them. And usually, you know, once we find out they are in lamb, uh, we work backwards. So two weeks before they're due, um, we work it as half a pound a life. I think it's extremely important, you know, to get off the farm because you know, you're every day, all day, every day on the farm doing the same things within reason and, you know, you get into your head too much. <laughs> it's, it is, you know, you need to, even if it's other farmers, you need to get out, you need to speak to people, um, you know, because it's a tough industry, you know, when it's going well, it's, it's amazing, but when it's not, you know, it gets you quite down. It does, you know, if you have a bad lambing or a bad spell with something, you know, it, it's, it's not good for you. You need to get out and and, you know, meet new people, have a bit of a laugh. For some people, going to work is a chore, but for others, it's a pleasure. The best part of this job is, like, there's not really one best part. You know, there's, there's so many benefits of doing this job. You know, there's just working with sheep every day, working with the dogs, working with the livestock, seeing how everything's looking, and uh, it just, it does, it brings you a lot of joy to make sure, like, you're, you're doing your best to make sure the farm's doing its best, so. I do like to, you know, go elsewhere and go gathering. It'll be really good if I can get this year with the pup, because she's, you know, it'll, it'll do the world a good to her. Um, and it's, it's a great way to, you know, meet new folk and, discuss dogs and just <laughs> just have a bit of a time away from the farm. Some good advice is very valuable. For any woman, you know, whether she's already in agriculture or hoping to get into the industry, my key advice is, you know, just keep your head up, dig your heels right in and just, you know, let your work speak for itself because we're always going to be, you know, criticised and I find, you know, being a woman in this industry you always have to prove that you can do something, you know, whether it comes to dozing and jagging yows, whether it comes to, you know, anything just to do with the stock. You know, you're very, um, I find we're quite ridiculed for things because they don't think we can do it. But actually, we can do it fine, maybe better than men in some cases. I mean, there's um, the jobs I like to call nursery jobs, like lamb and thyme jobs. Um, so, uh, you know, you're, you're feeding lambs and checking pens, watering pens, all that sort of stuff. I actually find the women the women's touch is like it makes it because we're a bit more like, oh is that one okay? And we'll just we'll just double check this one and I, I think I find anyway that with that bit of women's touch it's you know, you might save an extra couple of lives. It's always about how you can do your job the best you can. It's always about how how can the farm improve? What can we do that would make it easier or better? The main feature crop health-wise of the last month has really been the exceptionally cold and dry winds that the crops have experienced. So for the winter cereals, for the winter barleys and wheats, that's really held back development and also served to knock back disease. So it's been more effective than any uh, early fungicides. So I'm standing here in some winter barley and generally crops have been really held back by that cold weather and are often still to lift up into stem extension. It's begun to lift away now, but the disease has been fairly knocked back. We're seeing little bits of Rhynchosporium in crops, some net blotch, uh, and to a lesser degree some mildew, but only in the very advanced areas uh, like the Black Isle, so that might need managing. Spring barley is similarly, so they are still being drilled, um, but are often taking a while to come through, so many have been in the ground for two weeks before emerging. And where they have come through, they're just looking a little stressed and yellow from the, the cold, dry conditions, but will hopefully green up quickly now that we're into warmer temperatures. So the winter barley crop here, it's just had its uh, T1 sprays. And what we're aiming for there is a mixture of balanced chemistry that manages the spectrum of disease. So in this case, Rhynchosporium and net blotch. Um, and then the next spray to the crop will be to protect the upper leaves from, from Rambularia. But you can see the kind of frost uh, damage and pinching that this crop's experienced just in the, the very cold and dry weather, which has been stressful to the crop. 
So we're now in a crop of winter wheat uh, and as with the other winter cereals, the cold has really held back development and will probably be quite rapid now that we're into warmer temperatures. What to watch for in the wheat crops at the moment, you can see that the lower leaves have really been dried up by the, the cold and dry conditions. So the septoria that was previously on them has, has really uh, disappeared, although it will still have moved into these newer leaves. This crop is still to come up to grow stage 32, which is when we're putting on these T1 sprays. And the point of that is that then that's when final leaf three will be emerging. The temptation can be to go on slightly early and then we end up with an extended gap to T1, which lets disease come in. And the other one to watch out for at this timing is eye spot uh, on the stem basis here. So again, it's a disease that hasn't enjoyed the cold, dry conditions and there isn't much at the moment, but it is one to check for, particularly in the early drilled wheats that you might have. A couple of key things to remember for this season. It is the first season we're going into without any chlorothalonil in programmes. And we've also had changes around epoxyconazole, so that's a, an active that has to be used up this year and can't be bought or sold. So what we're aiming to do at these uh, T1 timings is to get a mixture of chemistry in there, but probably adding in a multi-site as well. So this year that will be Folpit instead of chlorothalonil. Not quite as effective, but really important in terms of bolstering the activity of the other components in that spray programme and also helping to steward against fungicide resistance. Oilseed rape has been one of the crops that's been most stressed by the cold, dry winds. Uh, and some of them were bent almost double. But now coming away nicely, uh, the risk of light leaf spot was high, but actually the amount that's actually appeared in crop hasn't been dramatic. And we're now moving into the flowering sprays, which will protect the crop from sclerotinia. And again, the cold, dry weather has been helpful in that regard. So it's kept back the development of the sclerotia, which will germinate and produce the spores that could infect the crop. So the risk from that source is low at the moment. But again, keep an eye on the weather. So the connection between a uh, temperature and rainfall around flowering. So in terms of those flowering sprays, try and use a different form of chemistry to that which you've used earlier to manage the foliar diseases because that just makes it a bit harder for fungicide resistance to develop. So one of the key pest risks at this timing at the green bud stage is, is pollen beetles. So you can see they've moved into to this crop. So they're um, eating into the, to the buds here and, and can affect yield. Obviously by the time you're moving into flowering, although they're visible, it's past the benefit of treating and always stick to pest thresholds. So a couple around the edges of the crop, as we are now, are probably not indicative of high levels in the middle of the crop. So do check that you're at threshold before you treat. Hello, I'm Raymond and welcome to the Rural Roundup. This week in farming, we are now well and truly into our IAX stroke single application form application process. The deadline is Monday the 17th of May for this important form. Please remember that this form is the gateway to support, to support payments and government grant schemes. So please afford it the necessary time. The Scottish Government would like all applications electronically. So please, if in doubt, contact them or your agent or your local consultant. The Agri-Environment Climate Change Scheme closes on the 30th of June for applications for slurry storage, agri-environment options on triple SIs and designated sites, organic farming and public access. The Scottish Government are also welcoming forestry grant scheme applications and these are approved on a rolling process. Also look out for the published recommendations on the Rural Payments website from the dairy, arable, pig, upland and crofting sectors. This week we've welcomed a spell of milder weather which has let us get well on with our spring work and calving and lambing. I hope this episode finds you well and please stay tuned for more from the Farm Advisory Service and Faz TV. Thank you. Next time on Faz TV, we visit Kirkton and Crichton, two of SRUC's research farms, and find out more about the methods and techniques they use day to day. Mm -hmm.